This anamorphic adapter was bought with my own money, I was a backer of the Kickstarter, and this review is not endorsed by Moment in any way, which means I can be as mean as I like. And I will be. This product is not perfect, there's a lot of things to weigh up before you invest in it, and here is my very honest, unfiltered review. First of all, the build quality. The minute you open this package, it just looks the business. You know, you've got a beautiful, well-constructed lens adapter, and even the step-up rings are the most premium I've ever seen. I got three in the box, so it gives me plenty of options to adapt to different lenses. That's the first thing you'll notice. The second thing you'll notice is when you pick it up, it's like a brick of glass. <laughs> it is absolutely super, super heavy. The reason that this caught me off guard is if this was just a lens at this weight, it wouldn't be the end of the world. It would be quite a heavy lens, but it's not the end of the world. But when you consider that you have to put it on the end of your lenses, some of them big, some of them small, it makes the overall package really, really front heavy and quite cumbersome. Some combinations are insanely heavy. For instance, my cinema lenses are Micro Four Thirds. With this, they're heavy to begin with, then you add this. I, I would not recommend using certain setups without uh, a cage and support rails. So you can have your cage and then you can connect the support rails on the bottom and then you have sort of this thing to so sort of put the lens on top. Just because it's so much blooming weight going on to the connector of your camera, it's better to be safe than sorry. Have you seen a sillier adapter? I will say some setups you can use relatively okay without your cage and your supports. For instance, the 85mm Lumix L mount. It's exactly the same size as the filter. They're both 67mm, so it goes on absolutely fine. And then you can kind of hold it and support it with your hand as you work. So initially my main complaint was the form factor, with it being so front heavy. But using it on the Lumix Primes, it's actually quite nice. So just be aware, certain setups you will need a big ass rig. <laughs> and certain setups you can get away with less. Because this adapter vignettes quite significantly at anything 50mm and above, definitely including 50mm in full frame, you can only really use the 85mm in that lineup, unless you shoot in APS-C mode, which will get rid of a little bit of the vignetting. This 85mm is tack sharp, beautiful depth of field, clinical really in its results, and adding the anamorphic adapter definitely added some character into these scenes. I love the subtle flair, I loved the oval bokeh and I think it overall just softened and made the image a little bit more pleasing from the 85. It's a great lens but it is a little bit modern, you know, a little bit like there's not much character to it and the anamorphic lens added buckets of character. And in terms of vignetting, even the 58mm Helios lens, which shouldn't really vignette too much because it's over 50mm, does have a vignette in the scene, which is a bit of a pain in full frame this is. I think it's usable, I think it adds character, but it was a little bit disappointing to me to have it at 58mm because I thought anything above 58 would be super clean. So just keep that in mind. It's a usable vignette, you can probably edit it out, you can probably crop in. And I'm shooting in 3 by 2 open gate mode so I guess I'm getting more of the scene in than if I was shooting 16 by 9 but either way there is a vignette at 58 mil that's the bad side about the 58 mil however the good side is look at this footage I love that lens on its own it's beautiful but with the anamorphic adapter look how it makes the highlights bloom now I swear, when I shot this, there was no mist filters or anything. It's just this lens and this adapter and nothing else. And look at the highlights. I think that is so gorgeous. It's a completely different look from the 85mm. And I think that's where the magic happens with this adapter. Because in theory, the combinations that you can get and the creative results you can get with it are as infinite as lenses you have. Same subject, same night two different lenses, and I think the footage just makes me smile. Price. Yes, it is pricey. It's around $1,000 or so, and there may be a couple of different things that you need to buy on top. Like, I didn't have an 82mm ND filter, so I've had to buy one of those. I didn't have my support rails or this doofer, so I had to buy this to go on my cage. There may also be different step up and step down rings that you need as well. It's not a cheap overall package. However, if you compare that price, let's call it $1,000, compare that to buying one anamorphic lens, yes, you will get one premium lens but it will be one focal length it will be a one trick pony and I 
semi-guarantee that it'll spend half the year in, in your cupboard gathering dust because it is a very specific look with anamorphic, particularly if you're only stuck with one focal length. I think bang for buck, I will use the adapter more because it's more versatile. Time will tell, but so far, I think I will stand by that statement. And another great benefit, it might be obvious, but I'm gonna say it anyway, it's not tethering you to one camera system. With this, it will work full frame, it will work APS-C, it will work micro four thirds, it will work across the board so long as you have the right adapters to make it work and the focal length does not vignette too much. And I find that very, very exciting, especially when it comes to vintage lenses. And I can adapt them to both full frame and micro four thirds very cheaply with speed boosters. The looks that you can get from either of those systems is, is incredibly diverse for the same piece of kit. Now, what about when it comes to shooting your anamorphic? My favorite modes are the open gate modes. So on the S5 Mark II, we have a 6K 3.2 open gate. The reason I love that, aside from it looking delightful, is when you squeeze it down, you have very subtle letterboxes and you could punch in a little bit and actually use it in a 16 by nine timeline without losing too much data. So for me, I think not committing to a fully letterbox project and having the ability to add in this anamorphic stylized footage into any project I want without too much letterboxing or no letterboxing is quite exciting to me. It works very similarly with Micro Four Thirds because we have the four by three open gates and in that one you do have a 60p one as well, which is always handy. And both the cameras have anamorphic stabilization. So if your camera has IBIS, sometimes you'll have a little bit of weird wobbling in the edges because it doesn't quite know how to stabilize anamorphic footage. Both of these Lumix cameras have an anamorphic mode. It does stabilize the footage quite well, but it's not as forgiving as if you were walking with a standard lens. Turn on your anamorphic stabilization if your camera has it when you use these. And if not, stay quite still because the wobble can be a little bit distracting. Some argue that 1.33 times squeeze isn't true anamorphic and I do think that. I think you know you've got to get to maybe 1.6 at least, 1.8 and then the actual cinema grade is two times squeeze so this is very subtle compared to that. However if you just want a flavour, if you want creative choices to add in some nice amber flares and some oval bokeh and to have sort of a wider letterbox output it does do all of those characteristics very well. But the results will differ depending on the system you're using, the sensor size and the lens you pair it with, which isn't a con in my eyes. I think that's just creative candy land. <laughs> And the benefit of shooting on APS-C or Micro Four Thirds is you can use wider focal lengths before you see vignetting. So you do have versatility to get around the, the vignetting in that respect if you have smaller sensor cameras. If you are using manual older lenses, like the Canon FD lenses or the Helios lenses, because they are innately a little bit softer, focus peaking sometimes does not kick in. So I found nailing focus to be a little bit tricky in certain circumstances. And also if you are using a lens and you happen to knock the bottom lens, then no matter how you turn the top lens, you're never gonna get focus because the base lens isn't into infinity. There is a little bit of a learning curve and a little bit of practice needed to get good results with this lens. It's quite a slow process, perhaps more controlled environments where you have more time, narrative work where you have plenty of, of, of setup time is a little bit better than run and gun. This is not necessarily a run and gun setup. Just keep that in mind. It's not the kind of thing you can whip out of your bag, stick on your camera and off you go. It does take quite a little bit of a setup, getting the focus right, getting the correct settings on your camera. I've, I've changed one of my custom modes to anamorphic. So when I change to that mode, it goes to 1.33 squeeze so I can see what it looks like. And it also adds anamorphic stabilization as well. But if your camera doesn't do that, you'll have to root through the menus and do it manually. <laughs> I think the golden flares are very nice. And in certain circumstances, as you can make them go wild. With the oval bokeh, I think we have it in spades, actually, depending on the focal length and the aperture that you use and sort of the background, you know, lights that will show the bokeh balls will make it look more pronounced. But I think it does have plenty of the anamorphic style oval bokeh balls for my taste. Is it the most pronounced anamorphic look in the world? No, I don't think it is, but I do think it adds 
something. Particularly, I can't get over the blooming highlights in the Helios lens. That changed the lens characteristics entirely in a very pleasing way. So buy this lens if you want something creative that you can use across most of your camera lenses, most of your camera bodies, and you never quite know what you're gonna get. If that excites you, then this is the anamorphic solution for you. If you want something that's a little bit more reliable, run and gun and, and, and predictable, then maybe spend that thousand pounds on a dedicated anamorphic lens of your choosing. Speaking of, here is my review of the Lauer Nanomorph 50mm on my GH6 where I take it out in the rain and we have a good old anamorphic fun time.